Hello everyone, today we talk about the Byzantine Italian secular aristocracies at the time of the Exarchate. Recently we made a video about the ecclesiastical aristocracies and especially the ones of Rome and Ravenna that came to be the dominating one. Uh, but we never actually talked about the uh, properly the Italic secular um, land owning class fundamentally that uh, survived essentially the Gothic War and uh, was essentially, or at least there was an attempt to, to, to integrate it into the government of Byzantine Italy, the Exarchate, um, during the crisis that brought, in fact, to the Longobard invasion, the broader withdrawal of imperial power from the peninsula because of the Islamic invasions, the, the contraction of the empire uh, altogether. And we hinted at these um, secular aristocracies here and there, we're talking about Longobard history and stressing the importance of not drawing too much of a divide between, in fact, the uh, uh, Italian Longobard and the Byzantine world, because these came to essentially converge at some, at some point, at least uh, tendentially. Right, so even talking about Longobard history, we never addressed the uh, the eventual Longobard conquest of the same Exarchate, and in fact, a great part of what had been the um, Italian uh, Italian mainland Byzantine possessions uh, that would be eventually revived uh, later on. You know, Byzantine Italy has this uh, sort of back and forth with some waves of reconquest that were waged. Uh, by the Byzantines at different points, in spite of the pressure coming fact, from, from these um, neighbors like Longbirds, the Arabs, and so on. Uh, and that's in fact another story we'll have yet to, to explain, because a great part of that eventually triggered in the balance properly Byzantine Italy and decatapanate the rise of the Normans uh, and all this stuff. But what we will try to focus here, it's not even the, the aristocracy, actually this was obviously at the head of society and more at least in in a certain way than than in Longobard Italy but w the um, extreme power that the aristocracy and effectively the oligarchy back in the day had owned in late antique uh, Italy and as in the late antique world uh, didn't quite exist anymore after the Gothic War. And so there were some traits that have to do specifically with the militarization of the Byzantine Italic middle class. Uh, and in fact, in this aspect, the greater resemblance to the, to the Longbird one, right? Um, so as we've seen often, and as we will come back at some point also, given that you're particularly interested seemingly in this, the reduction of the Byzantine dominion in blocks surrounded by Longobard areas had deep consequences, understandably enough, on the social system. And this had been already envisaged in, in a certain sense by the imperial authorities when they had uh, not only settled parts of Longobard Federati and uh, also other other peoples actually uh, within the same imperial Italy, right? Uh, we think, for example, that the Longobards of Benevent were settled uh, in in the area where the duchy would have emerged uh, exactly during the time of the, of the main invasion before this one, um, and this was normal, as you understand, in in the empire. And just look at the multi-ethnic nature of Belisarius and Narses' army and what was properly the, the imperial army and, and society about. Uh, these were still frontier lands, right? Uh, Italy was crucial because of Rome, uh, because of this important, especially the the central and southern, um, say, uh, enclaves of late antiquity, especially on the coasts that, you know, at this point the Byzantines are exercising a telasocracy and that's what mostly they will have retain control of in Italy on the coasts, right, especially in the south, was kind of not just closer to Constantinople geographically, but also kind of culturally because of greater Greek 
influence and um, this older urbanization and uh, etc. The north was important uh, as much as the Byzantines probably were uh, had agreed together with the Longobards to settle the Germanic people in the Po Valley as a buffer state to use against the quite aggressively expanding Franks. Uh, this would be like we don't have uh, an explicit evidence of this, but the fact that there was no imperial mobile army, field army, in um, in Italy at the time of the Longobard invasion, and that even after th this had happened, every everything in Constantinople ran normally. There was no attempt to, to counter this in any form. Would would point to that direction. Also, considering in fact the international situation would make sense. It's just that the Longobards were uh, at the moment of the invasion. Uh, uh, of the settlement unruly enough to essentially uh, escape the control of Alban and his successors uh, so much that for, for a decade they wouldn't even uh, elect a king anymore that you know had been created as monarchs or some kind of leaders of people by the same Byzantines to you know kind of exercise hopefully but in this sense, as you understand, unsuccessfully, greater control uh, on this, by the way, very large uh, migration, because the, the Longobards possibly were the largest migration together with the one of the Ostrogoths in the world migration era, right? We, we, they, we think uh, something that could have reached properly between 100,000, 300,000. Italy had millions of inhabitants, so that was of relative uh, importance, but th these people were heavily militarized. They also settled in strategic areas, in fact, mostly along the Apennine, the interland, right, that was more difficult to control by the Byzantines themselves. And so what you have in the political geography of Italy at that point, this kind of, uh, in fact, quite uh, apparently irrational and uh, disarticulated um, land division between the Longobards and the Romans that, um, however, instead corresponded not just to our random settlement at the beginning, objectively with that force, the Longobards, had they been a united, you know, politically a united people um, at the moment of the invasion, would have taken over the entire peninsula immediately, right? Instead, the fact that they were fragmented, all the dukes reasoned individually, and they carved their own signories on their own all across the peninsula from north to south, um, even taking some uh, Droman they found in the in the Byzantine harbor and ravaging uh, up to Sardinia and places like this um, brought to um, the, this dispersion this kind of um, in fact um, uncoordinated um, uh, settlement of the Longobards and this turned the the entire peninsula in a frontier because a, a few kilometers away from wherever you lived unless you weren't like in the Po Valley or in some, you know, some parts of Apulia or Calabria, fundamentally you, you, you had the, say, the enemies next door. Uh, also this aspect, in fact, was not so, shouldn't be seen as overly dramatic. Of course it was a problem because um, this took the form of an actual uh, invasion and uh, uh, the strongholds that the Byzantines managed to to retain control or uh, of were besieged came you know as th the basis of further offensives so uh, it was a a troubled moment this is the first time i don't know the, the first time monte cassino was destroyed for example um by the longbirds that wanted to to raid the monastery etc but they didn't they wouldn't do that in their own in their own land right that this is what archaeologically speaking we see that of course the lands where they settled do not actually show nor historically nor archaeologically traces of destruction um, reinforcing by the way in fact the the um, the hypothesis of the controlled settlement even the three years siege of Pavia that eventually would become the the Longobard capital seems to have been to to have been an historiographical invention that had to be stressed by the sources because the great king Theodoric the god had done it um, against uh, Ravenna that was defended by Odoacer back in the day. So the Longbirds wanted to, you know, uh, even in a century afterwards, show off a little bit, said, ah, we also made a three-year siege of Pavia against the Byzantine, but there is no proof of that. 
Um, we know also that many Ostrogoths, especially in the northeast, that had remained settled by the uh, that the Byzantines simply let be there, joined the Longbirds, opened the gates, uh, and so on. So war did break out, but only where essentially the Byzantine control was, was threatened, uh, whereas the rest of society kind of adapted. And as we explained uh, uh, many times, uh, the Longbirds actually were bringing a model that was much more uh, interesting and, and convenient for the majority of the uh, of the Italian inhabitants that were uh, that had been up to the Gothic War largely colonists that is to say serfs uh, under uh, the great oligarchs the the of the the owners of the enormous estates the latifundia that still you know embodied the Sen Roman senatorial aristocracy etc that during the war had gone fundamentally destroyed just you know with the ravaging and, uh, and all you know during the Gothic War, the armies made back and forth like three, four times. It was it was a, a, a freaking mess, um, and even the god Totila had famously promised the 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 Serbs freedom had they joined the Ostrogoths in the in the clash against the Byzantines. And as you know, that coming back was pretty powerful. It was a a dramatic. This was a, a a revolution in many ways. This, this, as we often stress, this is radical for understanding anything about Western. Uh, um, the Western Middle Ages, um, this revolution occurred in Italy, in Britain, didn't occur in Gaul, didn't occur in Spain. Right? And this would draw some enormous differences historically, because literally wh whatever you can think, especially about talking about Italy, the Renaissance, you know, it started all paradoxically because of what was triggered at that point in early medieval times, because the wealth distribution was completely different from other areas that instead had had a, a greater continuity with the Roman um, with the Roman world. And equally from the other side, as we often explained, the Franks had their the, the roots of their military machines within the Roman Latifundia of Gaul that had remained largely intact and could serve for developing their their clientele and heavy cavalry that we all know, um, eventually taking over the entire um, you know West. And um, and so the the Byzantines would say the areas that were f first of all it was difficult sometimes to say who was who there literally not even who owned the land but let's say we we know that within the same Byzantine uh, field there were longbirds right the the most of the war that actually ravaged at that point in the in the eighties in the nineties. When the when Autari managed to establish the Longobard Kingdom for for good uh, till uh, with the Italian Kingdom up, up to Napoleon basically as an institutional reality, um, the, um, the there were plenty of Longobards within the, the the imperial side. Right, it was effectively more like a civil war among the Longobards than kind of a Longobard versus Byzantine thing. Autari beheaded more. Longbird chieftains in that in the Po Valley then then killed uh, Byzantine officers. The Byzantines, of course, you know, we don't know the numbers of such things, but uh, it's powerfully figurative. I mean, the, the Longbirds were shared. We have sources claiming there were tens of thousands settled in Armenia by by the Imperials because as as an army, at least they went to fight there against against the Persians. Um, they were quite important. Uh, commanders in chief in important strategic theaters like the Balkans that were Longbirds and or also of other Germanic stocks that had migrated together with the Longbirds and they were originally Longbirds like Thuringians, Swabians, etc. Um, in, in Italy. Um, so we never really talked thoroughly about that part but it's mind-blowing. In any case this, this first generations that went on also with the Byzantine invasion of the Po Valley together with the uh, Franks to try to wipe the Longobards out, which failed badly, um, produced a, definitely a, a militarization of, of Byzantine Italy uh, in many ways, because the situation was very unstable. Initially, the Imperials thought they could take back the Po Valley that had an important strategic relevance for the aforementioned reason and where the Longbirds had established their own kingdom, so kind of reviving even these other fringes that were scattered all, all across the peninsula. 
and don't think there that geographical proximity was the, the connection. Very often, I don't know, longbirds settled in southern Italy were kind of more faithful to the kings of Pavia than the ones, uh, as we've seen, at outer of the St. Paul Valley, but places like Spoleto, especially in the Apennine, historically speaking. And after that, and some defeats that the imperial army suffered at the end of the Longobards, at the beginning of the 7th century, the imperial said, you know, what? Well, yeah, we, we accept that you Longobards are here, and that some territories have been occupied and ruled by you, and that, that's the state of thing. Of course, the Romans thought always to take back everything that had been part of the Roman Empire up to Scotland, right? But that was not going to happen. Um, and in any case, Constantinople had more problems and more important problems to, to cope with than the now Italy that after the, the plague, the war, etc., had become just you know, a decentralized, faraway province of relative importance compared to the destiny of, uh, of the empire altogether at that point. And, and so there is a further homogenization by osmosis, by natural proximity, of the fact of Longobard, Italy, Byzantine, Italy. We know that. We know that archaeologically speaking that, I don't know, that there were the frontier areas that were, I don't know, Byzantine officers administering some land bordering with, you know, the land of a Longobard duke, and they uh, they were at peace most of the time. They traded, they, they saw each other, they met, they exchanged stuff, um, and so they kind of became the same, right? Also, this is the point. It's properly a at that point, considering the the Byzantine and Longobard presence, we don't have to think about them as the subject of the situation. The subject of the situation is the Italian population. That is effectively what eventually nurtures the Longobards, that maintains a Byzantine society, um, and that is essentially what the country will be molded like uh, exactly in those times, and the Longobards essentially absorbing gradually also the Byzantine islands, and so bringing to this further leveling uh, of the differences. So, at the time of Justinian, the senatorial aristocracy intended to restore the economic patrimonial basis that they had traditionally uh, owned. Um, and this historically, as we were saying before, were enormous. Like, every great family had mm, often... Uh, land in multiple parts of Italy, even in Sicily, right? Uh, even the same pub, the same church had things like this. I mean, enormous estates, enormous latifundia. After the Gothic War, this had finished, had been destroyed. First of all, the Italic aristocracy had been dispersed by the war. Um, some had been killed, others had fled to Constantinople. There are beautiful studies, biographically, uh, think about the Dioscuridus of Vienna, all these kind of manuscripts that witness the, the, the fleeing of the, this Italic Latin aristocracy to, to Constantinople and bringing with it these enormous cultural treasures that, frankly, Constantinople didn't have because it was kind of a more recent creation and the aristocracy was something coming from a much lower background compared to, to the immensely... Um, uh, old and noble um, families that had ruled over Italy since uh, the, ver the beginning of, of Roman aristocracy, you, you, can, you could argue. Something really deep as a cultural divide. But that late antique world, in fact, uh, was dying out, had died out, right? Uh, we made videos about late, late antiquity, saying what, I what is it? What? Uh, when you look at the history of Southern Europe, you realize that late antiquity didn't even die traditionally with these marks that we often uh, stigmatize that the year is like, you know, the arrival of the Longbirds. Ah, oh, what a terrible thing. Not not truly really much. Uh, even the same Islamic conquest, I don't know, places like Spain, etc. We say, ah, oh, that's the end. It, the early Middle Ages begin. What does that mean? Factually nothing. Right? Not just because the Middle Ages or any other era never existed. It doesn't mean absolutely anything. Um, but because we are discovering, also archaeologically speaking, that there was a dramatic continuity in many ways, and there is a, a, an enormous debate, in fact, on whether to consider this as more like, even for later times, what we witness, even just studying 
uh, the history of the high middle ages like we, we do realize that that these lands have a, a much greater drive and infrastructural uh, background and kind of advancement than, than other areas of Europe that eventually try to level the whole thing by saying, oh, well, the Middle Ages arrived, you know, just darkness. And no, really, there, there is still this wave that historically, as it had been, I don't know, from Mesopotamia or Egypt, right, civilizing places like Greece and then in turn like Italy and then in turn like Central Europe. Well, it, it, that wave from south to north was going on kind of all the time. I mean, the same Longobards at this point we consider them properly Germanic because their kingdom, politically and institutionally, was exclusively Germanic. But of course, they were legislating in Latin. They were uh, administering uh, the kingdom from palaces. They exercised justice. They were literate, right? Something that I don't know. North of the Alps, as we was playing many times, was was like what? Right? <laughs> Nobody. Right, it was just war. Right, that's all what the, the aristocracies did, and nothing else. So, this is one of those chapters, and again, in my opinion, are probably some of the single most overlooked in, in Western history, and that nobody really takes into adequate account. But from from the imperial side, this was kind of tough because, first of all, just imagine to leave from from the Byzantine side of the peninsula, you realize that the empire that theoretically you were under had bailed out right you were there to stay because you had to protect your assets your property whatever but fundamentally you lived in a land that was largely dominated by the longbirds that mostly controlled also the the majority of the population frankly as a byzantine you would have mostly lived in contexts uh, close to cities to to the to the coast so you had some horizons that in a way even surpassed the the italian one because uh as you know, the Byzantines inherited a great part of it in what had been the Hellenic mindset, for real. It's not a cliche, right? When we say, oh, yes, but, but there were Romans. Yes, yeah, but factually, that's that's why Byzantine is not really... doesn't mean anything either, but it's not really something that we came up with we, for, for no reason. And I made multiple videos explaining why we do. So the story, I know, because they called themselves Romans. Blah, 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 blah. Yes, because you, you call modern nationalities today with the names that they actually have. Start calling the Germans the Deutsch instead of the Germans, for example. You're not going to do that. You're just a fanatic that discovered that, you know, Byzantine history existed. You want to show off saying that they were Romans, but even if they were, still, you know, the next step, at least for somebody that goes after the the first year of universities understanding why what what's the deal with the term byzantine and not just thinking that some idiot invented it for no reason that you're special just because you found out uh, by yourself um actually not even by yourself so uh, the um the the situation was dramatic because especially the, the land the italic landowner because you see the majority of the population in italy had always kind of been uh, in this area, especially in, in the center and the south, Italic, right? So there was properly a divide, even with the coastal dimension there. Um, the Hellenic mindset, as I was saying before, was essentially urban based, uh, also kind of maritime based. It most lived in the cities. That very often, in fact, Byzantine Italy, I mean, even Rome at some point, if you study the epigraphy, uh, there is Latin and Greek alphabet used because there were enough important also Greek communities quarters that lived there but it's the city the city is uh, as it had al it always is in pre-industrial societies just a tiny part of the population the, the overwhelming amount of the population is the countryside and that's where the Longobards had the greatest success by the way but also in fact the Byzantines had to be aware of that because at the end of the day, these were true foreigners at that point. I mean, the army that had brought to the reconquest of Ostrogothic Italy were were Greeks, were Anatolians, were people coming from places that had nothing to do with Italy. So we have seen it also with uh, the, um, the the other video about uh, Rome, the Militia Romanorum, that initially. Yeah, at this point, we're kind of properly Byzantine garrisons coming from overseas. Eventually, um, at least there, there was a the, the the trace of a military occupation that had properly been brought from the outside. In part, this this um, element 
was absorbed by the, the italic background, but in part it, it had still been always, of course, the italic background had provided the bulk, at least of the militias that were necessary to maintain the local land. As we were saying before, it was not even properly mobile army. Uh, so it was the militia factory, as we've seen, as of Rome, of Ravenna, and of the other places that was kind of acting uh, on active duty, let's say, to, to defend the, uh, the land. I mean, we're talking about important threats. Rome was besieged by Agilul, for example. We know that the countryside was, was ravaged. The peasants were deducted as slaves and sold in, in France, right? So th this is not really a, a gentle time, and you, you do need to be militarized, and uh, it's the local communities that have to provide that, you know, where or not. And um, as it's normal with uh, territorially, with any mil any place, with any community, and with in their militias. But m more than that, the uh, elites that ruled Byzantine Italy had to realize, and in part they would succeed, in part not, the importance of winning over the countryside, because that was the real point for the control of Italy. And the, um, in part, this was successful. I mean, some enlightened elites, such as the papal one in Rome, that was of dramatic uh, elevation, considering the fact that they were, I mean, think about Gregory the Great. We made a video about Santa Quitsis, where we explained how Gregory the Great was, as you know, from one of the, the gens Anicia, right? One of the most noble senatorial families uh, of Rome um, that had undertaking the ecclesiastical career, what, what a career, essentially the most important pope uh, of the Middle Ages, together with Innocent III, um, had understood, and that's why I made the video on St. Equitius, that uh, the model that this Roman aristocracies had to adopt in order to win over the populace was the peasant one, which was a big that's the genius of the Pope there, because uh, m men like him and his entourage were haughty oligarchs, noblemen, aristocrats. What the hell did they care? They, they lived in Rome. Rome. What the hell did they care about stinky peasants in the countryside? Nothing. But the Pope understood that, of course, that was where the, all the labor uh, fighting uh, an economic uh, you know, for a demographic force came from in the first place, and they needed to win over this 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 uh, communities. By the way, they were scared, they were afraid. They had seen the Gothic War; they were defenseless. Um, they they were just the the colonists of of of, of the generations before that had remained in, in that uh, condition for centuries. They ne never kind of seen any form of self organization or awareness, etc. The, the the world at that point, after the plague especially, the, the, the brutal economic demographic contraction was poor, was terribly poor. Uh, it was incredible, and the, the beautiful early uh, medieval geography that we have is one of the most single most important sources to study so many of these aspects, including the military one. And so, an other... Um, um, elites were not so uh, long-sighted, let's say, because they instead preferred to enforce the older late antique model that was based, in fact, on a structure that, as we've seen, didn't quite exist anymore socioeconomically, but st still enforced through the Byzantine officials this heavy fiscalism, uh, the maintaining of a, of a bureaucracy that, that factually equated to tributes to Constantinople. And the people in these areas, of course, didn't want to pay these taxes because they said, "Who the hell are the people in Constantinople? The Roman emperors, yes, and where are they now?" Right. So we have, in fact, letters complaining, you know, from between Byzantine officials and local bishops, etc., that the population of the countryside was fleeing the Byzantine territory and going to live in the Longobard one, willingly, because the Longobards would take anyone in. Right, it was uh, basically n no discrimination of any sort. You were Roman, you had been, doesn't matter. At that point, the small middle class was basically the same everywhere. In a couple of generations, everybody would become a longbird um, in those territories. So, uh, 
um, this was a this was proven also on the battlefields. I mean, as we often see, if you, wars cannot be fought if you don't have this decisive support of the population. And Longbirds had won uh, against the invasion of, of of the of the mobile army that had arrived, by the way, and the Franks together. Why? Because the population had supported them because they had resisted, right? They they were apparently barbarians, the nefandissima gens, as the in the Latin. Uh, letters that they were described at the time by the Pope, by the, by the Exarch, the Emperors, uh, they had managed to resist because they had the overwhelming support of the Italian population. Right? They there were, there were some, you know, local Ro Romanic populations were more supported than the Longobards. It's some Longobard dukes passing from the Byzantine side anyway. I mean, passing. Some of them had thought to settle there because on behalf of the Byzantines, right, uh, or at least, uh, you know, from, from their side. So, it was a, you know, the, the show of, the display of, a, of an important moral uh, force um, uh, shift that occurred, that had already occurred probably during the Gothic War, um, with the liberation of the masses from, from the pre-existing order, and the, the obvious requirement from the majority of the population that to be freer, not to be under the uh, elephantic bureaucracy and taxation of a of an empire that was not even a Roman one in their eyes because it was at least nor it was not a, an Italian one for sure anymore. So this um, this is a big deal, right? And it is great part of the same success again of the Italic kingdom for for centuries to come after all. And the referees of the Byzantine emperors in Italy were still the aristocrats, right? And these aristocrats, as we've seen, they had passed from, from great splendor that had maintained also during Gothic times, etc. But they thought better to call the Byzantines back because they still hoped to be more, uh, say, reintegrated into the, the Byzantine trade game, but still enjoying the, the centralized position in the West. Now they had lost a lot, and they fundamentally had just just a a provincial horizon at this point. That's that's how much they, they could ask. They were essentially confused with the landed aristocracy of originally lesser status. Uh, it could be either of Italic tradition or um, um, of foreign one because of the presence of greek and eastern elements within the uh, mercenary militias and in the bureaucracy for their um, uh, radically local control uh, because there is this aspect too there are i don't know if you look at just the list of the byzantine exarchs you see they're greek names latinized maybe but still they for for some also ideological reason they they thought to be like look we are the Byzantines we're not we're something else we belong to that world over there in the east Constantinople not this one really um, eventually as you know also the the Byzantine exarchate would would operate on its own um, in the Italian theater like just minding its own interests but in, it still was importantly connected ideologically to the to the imperial government in the peninsula. Um, today we, we are talking obviously about the Exarchate that as you know controlled just the peninsular part. Then it was Sicily, there was Sardinia, it were, that's, um, that's another thing a bit, uh, just also historically, but uh, that mostly the, the, the Apenninic world we're, we're looking at, or at least the, the coastal one, because again the Apennine was mostly uh, Longbird at that point. And as we were saying before, the trend of military enlistment and hierarchical order of the army and of the bureaucracy uh, witnessed the ever more frequent uh, emission of local Latin elements. So in every region of Byzantine Italy, uh, this is present also in Sicily, etc. Uh, 
we witness um, substantial coincidence among the political, military, and administrative cadres and the regional aristocracy that was mandatorily called to services and functions that changed their same civile tradition. So this is clear. You have a fading projection of the imperial government and army in the peninsula and therefore who governs, think about the teams later on, uh, the exarchate itself was kind of a predecessor that it, it is the rise of the local administration is that the centralized government with full by the way military powers uh, you know in absence of, of uh, a greater uh, a greater command stationed there from Constantinople uh, that of course is going to made up of the local populace we've seen it in the other video with the Militia Romanorum of the Papal Guards uh, that passed from this kind of Byzantine garrison plus Roman militia to, to an actual full-fledged papal army and a hell of one, by the way. Um, and plus even other elements in Rome, at least that was quite of an international city, makes it the exception to where the skull of the, of the Saxons, of the Franks, of the Longobards. That, that's another story. Um, but even in here, like even in Byzantine Italy, you have... A consistent amount of uh, foreigners, right? There are tons of Longobard officers, including the the generals uh, in the Balkans that you know were eventually buried in in Ravenna, for example, and people from other places. By the way, at this point, uh, the migration here was, was still ongoing. At a certain point, the Longobards settled in the count uh, in in the area of Molise in, in in central Italy on the Adriatic Sea. Some some Bulgars. And we see, in fact, in the local, in the local tombs, there are literally Bulgar panoplies next to the Longobard ones. It's it's mind blowing to see them there. Like, um, and so you know that the imperial army was kind of a melange of all the possible races that you can uh, imagine. But the decentralized government brings in Italy to be mostly an Italic one, right, a Latin one. And, and the most important change here also is the militarization of the same. Because the class of the uh, landowners, so the, the, the average farmers, essentially became the militia. In a military and hierarchical meaning, that is to say, with an awareness of themselves. Uh, something that the old municipal courier of the late Roman Empire had lost together with their own autonomy when the Empire had reduced them to barely more to uh, an instrument of fiscal uh, exaction. This is a radically important dynamic for two reasons. First of all, the possessores are nothing else but what in Longobard Italy would have been the exercitales, that is to say the, the free land owners who, uh, in virtue, in fact, of their assets, could afford a military panoply with certain classes, degrees, at least that the first um, outlined ones that we have documentarily are the ones of Eistulf in the 8th century, but they existed everywhere in Europe. I mean, they were, I mean even the Romans back in the day had had the same thing, you know, with the, the, the census, etc. Uh, this fundamentally comes back, right, because uh, these say the area was heavily urbanized as you understand and still with the decadence of the cities the, the Italian centers were quite active and so the collapse of the latifundium the collapse of the 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 mega land owner with serfs working factually uh, the land that serfs that had been um, disarmed kind of um, mm, uh, properly brought away from, even from a military mindset in this turbulent moment instead comes back because they factually own now something they're kind of like colonists even properly in frontier areas and so it's important to have them it's important to have the the farmer uh, that can afford his own defense uh, together with his own community somewhere in the interland because the longer birds can come to raid and they can be levied 
air and the, they, they make head to the city, to the, the old municipium that historically in the civic tradition of Rome had been properly like, like a sort of small city-state, another Rome with I its own uh, army that was proud of, it, proud of itself. The same thing happens in parallel in Longobard, Italy. In Longobard, Italy, there aren't big aristocracies either. Um, it's not like in Gaul, where like even a small of the Proteus could uh, have comparatively more land, even the Longobard king himself. The cities are important. Um, the, the municipal pride that eventually will be at the base of the communal identity of the high middle ages that also was a strongly militarized one in properly in ideologically speaking is to be found in the epigraphy there are noble families in the city that are proud of themselves you understand had the money to, to, to show off to we know of military clientels fighting in, in the cities and providing in fact their troops to the Longobard army itself so this is the communal movement in in ultra embryo right um, and and yet still probably overlooked for this kind of and so there, there is a continuity with uh, the uh, the older world but also in the process a remilitarization of the uh, Italic uh, peasantry that historically just like most of the Western ones the ones in the Empire had been disarmed had lost it's uh, had been first gentrified and losing its warlikeness and then impoverished during the the late Roman Empire and reduced to colonists that is to servitude now that system is broken these people are exposed to threat they have something to administer on their own they come back to be combative um, and to to defend in fact the, their own territory and naturally even properly the injection of Germanic elements in this culture of uh, a free um, a w uh, free man w warrior hood in, in a sense was was important just from an uh, from an imitative point of view as we were saying before in Longobard Italy for example kind of everybody became a Longobard everybody became an exercitalis right and and so there, there was a, an enormous pride attached to this and it's the same base in fact for which later on um, these areas in Europe would traditionally maintain their own juridical freedom historically again north of the Alps instead mostly that had been lost you would expect again that was the center of you know tribal egalitarianism they lost it because aristocracies there were developing without any control because there was no public authority pre-existing settled reality so the the aristocracies took over and brought what were the freemen fundamentally under in Italy, paradoxically, this was this went the other way around. They became ever freer, and ever more autonomous, right? And in spite of all this mess of the God of War, the destructions, etc., considering that the Italian peninsula maintained the highest per capita wealth in the world uninterruptedly from the Roman Empire through uh, throughout all the Middle Ages up to the the 17th century when the Netherlands, when England surpassed them, but let's say not even this massive crisis had brought kind of that middle class Italic peasantry attitude kind of down in spite of all. So it's this is r radically impacting the history of the entire uh, peninsula for, for centuries to come. And so this capacity of action and also of insurrection will be evident right this uh, people turned their arms sometimes against the same Byzantine government especially at the end of the seventh and the first decades of the eighth century during the iconoclastic repressions when the same exarch was killed by the locals um, this this was particularly evident in, in fact in Ravenna in the Pentapolis so in the kind of the, this five cities that were in the south of Ravenna itself that had maintained that important um, municipal autonomy and pride and that were framed in turn under their own aristocracies so aristocracies that wouldn't let uh, the the imperial government at that point act 
as they pleased anymore. Because at that point, especially during the iconoclasm, that was poor foolishness in, in insight from a, at least surely from, from a Western perspective. Um, the aristocracies knew pretty well that iconoclasm in that case was an excuse just to, to, to pillage their own land, their own monasteries, where these families had invested their own assets and so on, because that factually what, what it was, a large part, was the confiscation and enormity of monasteries all over the empire, especially in Sicily, in southern Italy, who were rich of that. Um, and the imperials had their own reasons historically, because the, the, this is evident in many areas of the empire and the Balkans, etc. Et the, the monastery had become sometimes the harbor of some pre-existing, like, quasi-pagan cults that had somewhat remained, that had gathered the attention of the, the, the peasantry and that had grown rich and powerful like local lords. So again, there were some reasons. These are not the only reasons of the iconoclasm, which by the way is an extremely complicated thing to study. I had the, the luck to, to meet one of the you know, world experts in the iconoclasm that really you know, makes you reflect. Also because we don't know much about it in itself. We know the iconoclasm through those who put it down, right? That he actually also inherited a, a big deal of iconoclastic stuff, methods, etc., and contents, and that have also kind of blurred the idea of the iconoclasm. But more brutally, this this imperial policy was kind of a uh, was was a, a repressive um, kind of uh, sacking mean, right? To 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 get rid of provincial. Um, essentially to simply rob the provincial aristocracy in, ma in many ways, at least. Um, and, well, in Italy, the exarchs had to find out the hard way that this met at least what it, with a very harsh resistance, right? And also brought to a, an enormous deal of international problems uh, that shifted even more the Italic population towards the Longbirds, that at least uh, never ventured in any kind of uh, heretical speculation or theological dispute. They were Aryans at the beginning, they basically converted um, smoothly to Catholicism, and the whole Western Church was saying, look before monothelitism, then an iconoclasm, all the worst stuff that was coming from, from the East, right? What the hell are you doing in Constantinople? So much that, famously enough, like lots of people that were rep mm, repressed in, in the Byzantine Empire, from places like Syria, uh, other, in the heart of the empire, actually fled to Byzantine Italy, because they knew there that it would be more protected uh, than, than in the Byzantine Empire. Many in Rome, in Rome there was a famous, we've seen there were the Germanic schools, there were, there were but the, of, because of the pilgrims, but there was properly a Syrian Greek quarter that also founded some important churches, um, uh, some of which um, St. Mary in Cosme, I don't know if you ever heard of it, but that's, uh, that's quite an important one, that was made up of refugees coming from elites, by the way, uh, arist aristocrats, people that had a great influence in the local, you know, philology, literary production, even informed later on the Carolingian um, Renaissance, etc., that were in Rome because they had fled iconoclasm and they took refuge there because they knew that it was kind of a better place to live at that point than uh, because the popes were already quite powerful, not even the exarchs could actually touch them and they even sided with the Longobards against them, it's such a force by the way, and th there is a beautiful military history about that too and and yeah, th this is ex extremely meaningful and this is first of all, don't, con don't never give for granted what, what an empire is fundamentally about, like an empire exists if it is functional if people have reasons to be under it. And that's how empires, true empires, the, the, the real powerful ones are built. The ones that have to struggle to get a tiny bit of recognition from anybody and just use violence to be enforced and, you know, blackmail and steal and whatever, just to be recognized, they're not empires, right? Because they don't have the divine glory of the skies shining on them. The, the one that would make, I don't know, the Romans walk in the Hellenistic capitals just on, on, the, on the footsteps of Alexander without even unsitting their sword because the glory was so evidently over them that everybody would recognize them as ecumenic rulers. This thing had become 
much less and the Imperium was actually shining somewhere else, was shining f west and uh, the premises for this were being seen here and this in my opinion is one of the most important chapters uh, in, uh, in it's not even a chapter itself, it's a dynamic as you understand in western history it's brutally overlooked when I say that studying early medieval times and these realities here is, is crucial, it's because they are really crucial. This is not the, the history of a people just dwelling there, trying, struggling um, to, to have even something called like an administration or a state. These are realities that are really already on a, on a track that will make them take off in, in a very few centuries like crazy, like the, like the entire West, whereas the other civilizations they were having their heyday in a way, but they they remained kind of sclerotized within itself and incapable of change. So the West took there some moves that were really uh, remarkable, and this first attitude is, is kind of obvious. Like, how can you force me? What, what do you think you are to force me to do something that I really don't want? This is what it's really at the base of... Um, you know, of civilization. In part, you should understand whether something is is convenient. Uh, if there is an advantage or something, this could be evident in, in some moments where, I don't know, the, the Longobards had just invaded and they did seem like a uh, destabilizing force in the perilous one, but in the broader collapse of the world system, also for the plague, uh, the, the, the damage of the war itself and just the nature of what the imperial government had become, uh, what is this, right? You have to think, you have to witness a shift in the the actual power dynamics, and those power dynamics are given by God, are not yours just from a legalistic uh, point of view, like the Byzantines wanted to claim, that, like that the Imperium was just theirs, or they, they it wasn't, right? And uh, especially in this situation, the Renovatio Imperium in, in the West proved that uh, one couldn't really fool with what God really wanted in many ways. And, and this is probably m way more important than you think when, when you think about historical powers, in a way. Because um, some people are stuck to dichotomies like, you know, um, right and wrong based on what? Right on, on, I don't know, people killed. Uh, they don't even look at actions anymore. They don't even venture anymore. And th this is showing the regressing of the moral dimension. Uh, an empire can be successful because the peoples that are brought under are inferior to it. And they can't do better. Right? And, and we have witnessed this overwhelmingly historically. But I've also seen those powers that can't even subdue other peoples because they just can't can't make it. They just don't have as a critical mass the capacity to, to bring them down and at least uh, in forms of mil permanent military occupation or political influence sometimes political influence can be successful but say um, at some point every power kind of gains or loses uh, force because voice from the other side is, is a different moral temper so that Putting human life in practice on the same level, it's wrong. Uh, human life is invaluable in potential. In practice, is a completely different thing. And the same goes with empires. Right? There is, uh, uh, whatever here the empire was, was not even an ecumenic one anymore. And the reasons have to be read within what had happened within the same empire. Not just on, you know... That was the empire with that color, with that flag. No, it doesn't work like that. Every single polity has to be backed consistently and continuously with moral force. If you don't do that, the power doesn't just fall, but it kind of must fall. Because it has lost God's light. God's favor. And this is what we should recover as an idea. Uh, at any level and understanding how to cope with that because eventually that will be the only way to show uh, who deserved to rule and it never ends this struggle never ends and don't think that the reinjection in fact even of the Germanic peoples and this kind of 
more primitive but still kind of more traditional view of the relation between politics and war etc uh, in the West uh, doesn't have to do with that because uh, again we're talking about the same land where the Roman Empire had existed and that had changed a lot but really not so much uh, and so we're still looking at the same land at the same country and if this dynamics took place it's because the country wanted that always remember and this is very meaningful for for our days I think uh, in any case for today we stop it here just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content and for now I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time